All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this presentation is being brought to you by SAA's Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards. Uh, my name is Corey Neimer, and I'll be assisting today with the hosting of our session. Uh, today's session will be focusing on um, encoding, encoding controlled terms and archival descriptions. And before we get started, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Uh, first, uh, we have Alex Dury. Alex is the manager for archival metadata at the New York Public Library and the COVID tracking project archive lead with the University of California, San Francisco. He also serves on the National Finding Aids Network or NAFAN Technical Advisory Working Group, SAA's Technical Subcommittee for, Enco for Encoded Archival Standards, and is chair of the SNAC Technology and Infrastructure Working Group. Um, our other presenter is Regina Heberlein. Uh, Regina is a data analyst at Princeton University Library. She currently serves as co-chair on DAX uh, with Greg Wiedemann and is chair of the metadata subgroup of the Archive Space Te Technical Advisory Council. She is a current member of the Experts Group on Archival Description, or ECAD, at the International Council on Archives and has in the past served, among others, on TSEAS, the EAC CPF revision meeting in Berlin in 2020, and the Joint Task Force on the Art and Rare Materials Bib Frame Ontology Extension. So we're really glad to have uh, both of these speakers here today for our session. Um, maybe just to, to mention a, a word on the ser series itself. Um, this series on controlled vocabularies is being offered um, through TS, EAS, and the description section of SAA. And we've been doing it in two different time zones. Um, so one set of presentations uh, in a European, Central European time zone uh, aimed primarily at European and Oceania audiences. And then this series, of three sessions um, for the Americas and Europe. Um, each of these sessions, of these sessions, uh, we've sort of broken it down into a sequence of an introductory introductory session um, that was ran the last couple of weeks. Um, today, again, talking about encoding of those controlled vocabulary terms. Um, and then on April 12th, we'll be having two more sessions again um, on controlled vocabularies in practice. Uh, so each of these are taking a slightly different approach. I know the US session is looking at reparative description. And so if you're able to join us for those, uh, for either of those sessions as well, um, we'd love to have you. So at this point, I'd like to turn this over to Alex uh, for a little bit more introduction and then moving into our presentation. Great, thank you. Let me just get my screen shared. All right, um, hello, I'm Alex Dury, and I'll be discussing the details of encoding archival, uh, ar of encoding access headings in or encoded archival description. Um, we'll start with a general overview of how terms are encoded and then dive into the specifics of um, EAD 2002 and EAD 3. But first, I'd like to mention that uh, Lyricist is actually hosting a webinar um, on the agent subjects and classifications in archive space um, today at 1 p.m. Eastern time, um, immediately after this webinar. Um, if you signed up for it, fantastic. You get a full day of uh, control headings. And if you didn't sign up for it, the webinar will be made um, available later on, on the um, Archive Space uh, training hub. Um, if you're an ASpace user, I strongly recommend uh, checking it out as a follow-up to this uh, webinar. So as a general introduction to headings, um, they provide help in discovering, identifying, and localizing things such as people, corporate bodies, titles, and subjects. Um, headings are termed controlled since they follow specific rules in their construction, such as RDA or ACR2, and are sourced from authorities such as the LC name authority file or the Getty Art and Architecture thesaurus. Uh, vocabularies like these allow for centralizing the creation and maintenance of terms, 
and for ensuring that they're identical across records and institutions. Um, you may have uh, attended the first webinar in the series, which covered the uh, why of using headings and archival description. And today we'll be covering the um, actual how of encoding them. So broadly speaking, um, EAD allows for adding controlled access headings at any level of a finding aid. The control access wrapper element, which is what encapsulate, encapsulates all of the controlled access headings in a, um, in a descriptive, descriptive uh, item, can be added either at the, or, and either or at the uh, collection, or sorry, and or at the collection level of a uh, ArchDesk or at the component level of C. So essentially this flexibility allows for adding headings at whichever level is appropriate for the level of description you need. Um, for example, if you're doing detailed item level description, you may want to add in, say, uh, an item's author or correspondent. Or if you're doing more, um, if you're doing higher level processing, you may only want to add headings in at the collection level. So in EAD, um, there are nine total types of controlled access terms that are allowed. Corporate names, family names, functions, form and genre terms, geographic names, occupations, personal names, subjects, and proper titles. If you're familiar with other cataloging and descriptive standards, um, all of these are probably going to sound very familiar. The general structure of the control access wrapper element um, looks something like this. So as with many elements in EAD, control access supports a number of essentially formatting elements, such as table, head, list, and the P or paragraph tag. These are useful if, for example, you want to include a label to, to um, demarcate your access terms in a finding aid, or maybe say provide a list of, list of things along with your heading elements. And these are followed by the nine elements from the last slide, which can be added in any number and any order as needed. Um, there's no requirement that you use all nine. You can use, say, you know, 100 corporate names and zero subjects, for example, if needed. Um, you can pick and choose, essentially, for whatever your collection requires. And again, these are all wrapped up um, in the, in the uh, controlled access wrapper. So now that we've gone over the very general structure of control access and the types of elements that live inside of it, we can dive into the nuts and bolts of actually encoding heading terms in EAD. Um, each, each controlled access element, such as person name, should encapsulate one full and complete controlled access term. Um, this includes headings um, such as, for example, with multiple subdivided parts, such as the LC um, subject headings, and also names that uh, are followed by the titles of works. Um, good, practice require, good practice regarding term management applies to the headings um, in control access. Um, for example, the element text should also exactly match the controlled form of a name when possible. For example, a personal name should include Kermit, the frog, and not just Kermit. Um, headings should also be kept up to date so that they align with the headings and other finding aids and in MARC records. Getting specifically into the EAT 2002 standard, um, encoding headings is actually very simple. Um, within the full text of the heading just goes directly into the access term element. So for example, the term Kermit the Frog is encoded in a person name element just directly as is, with no child elements or anything. Um, and in our second example, the complex LCSH heading for Muppets Fictitious Characters subdivision drama is also just directly added into the uh, subject element as a complete uh, heading string, even though it has multiple subdivisions. And note that even though drama is a uh, form and genre term, since it's a subdivision of the subject uh, Muppets fictitious characters, the, the element name itself is going to be a uh, subject to reflect whatever the top level, uh, descript top level term is. And you can also see here in the third example where the type is person name, 
because the first uh, element in the heading is a personal name, even though it's followed up by a, a proper title. So in addition to the element name, which tells you what a heading is and the heading itself, EAD 2002 also provides a number of attributes for encoding additional information about a heading. Attributes for controlled access elements provide technical information about the heading and its relationship to the material being described by the collection or component record. For example, attributes are used to provide the source, authority identifier, and mark equivalent for a controlled heading. Um, none of the attributes are required. Um, you can just have elements like we had on the previous slide, but they do greatly enhance name headings and are highly recommended to use whenever possible. One thing to note is that EAD, in addition to the elements, the sorry, the attributes that we'll be covering, also provides support for a number of general attributes for managing um, XML elements as a schema. Um, these are elements, these are attributes such as ID, audience, and alt render, which are allowed on control access elements. Since these are universal across the entire EAD schema and are uh, not, not specific controlled access headings, we won't be covering these specific uh, attributes today. We'll just be focusing on the ones that are uh, specific to controlled access headings. So here's a sample personal name heading for Kermit the Frog, along with some technical information. The term has a source of LCNAF, an identifier, which is its LCCN, the cataloging rules it was crafted under, which are RDA, its relationship to the clutch material, where Kermit's the creator, and the mark mapping, which is 700. This information is all very important to include in the EAD heading, um, since it provides a lot of technical information for the maintenance and use of the name, but we need somewhere to put all this. So in EAT 2002, here are the attribute names that we would use for this metadata. Its identifier is the auth file number, the source is source, the rules are rules, the role is role, and the uh, mark mapping is encoding analog. By adding these to a person name element, we can provide a very complete name heading in our finding aid, which is which would be much more useful and maintainable than just a uh, basic uh, name string. So when we put all this together, we end up with heading elements like these. We have our name and subject headings, along with their identifiers when applicable, sources, mark mappings, and rules. Um, if we're working in EAT, EAT 2002, then we're done. Uh, we've encoded a name, we've and we've enhanced it with uh, technical attribute metadata so that both, both uh, users of the finding aid and uh, metadata maintainers can really make use of this uh, information. Now, moving on to EAD3. Um, almost all of what I just described for EAT 2002 still applies. The general structure for adding term types to control access, um, adding a heading string, and adding attributes all still applies. Um, it's probably 90% identical. There is one very big difference, though, which is the introduction of the part element to the standard. What part does is it allows for splitting a term into multiple pieces while still keeping it all bound together as a single heading. Um, so, for example, instead of adding the full term text into the element directly, as we would in EAD 2002, a term element now contains uh, one or more parts. And this allows for some very powerful access heading encoding, which we'll see momentarily. Um, one important note is that a term element, like a person name and a subject, contains one or more parts. If a term is simple, uh, for example, we just have the subject of Muppets uh, fictitious characters, then we only need one part to sufficiently uh, present the term. Uh, we don't need to subdivide it any further because we can't, we can't. It's, it is as it is. Um, there's also no requirement to subdivide a term into multiple parts. Um, so for example, you can split a name into the primary name, the secondary name, the title, um, numbers, et cetera, each in its own part, or you can encode the entire thing as one single big part. 
um, how you apply part is going to be left up to local practice and descriptive needs. Um, EAD itself is basically allows you, as long as you have one, you're fine. So here's an example of a subdivided subject. You can see how what was a single subject during an EAT 2002 of Muppets M drama is now two parts one for the top subject of Muppets and one for its subdivision drama. Note that the M that was in the subject heading previously is now gone. Uh, formatting elements are left out of divide of um, EAT, EAT 3 part strings um, since they're no longer needed. Um, the part itself is what provides the subdivision. And here's an example of a name that's split into parts. We have the primary part of the name, which is Kermit, and his title, which is The Frog. Um, once again, this is the, uh, the formatting of the comma is gone. Um, it's no longer needed in this string to separate out Kermit from the title of The Frog. So much as in EAD 2002, um, EAD 3 also provides for attributes to encode, encode further metadata about a heading. We'll look at the heading information that we used before for Kermit the Frog. Three of the attributes, source, rules, and encoding analog are exactly identical to EAD 2002. Uh, we haven't changed anything and we're already 60% of the way there. Two of the attributes are used identically to ones in EAD, EAD 2002, but have new names. Identifier, which replaces all file number, and relator, which replaces role. These were changed to better reflect your use in a linked data world, where, for example, you may use identifiers that aren't necessarily authority numbers. And note that in addition to being applied to elements like person name and subject, many of these attributes can also be applied to part. Um, only the relator is limited to the top level term type element. Now that we've covered uh, the part element and attributes, we can put this all together into full EAD3 controlled access headings. The first term looks very similar to the one that we used for EAD2002, um, where I have your, you know, the ID, the source, the rules, the term, et cetera. The only differences are that some attributes have new names and that we had to move the entire, we had to move the uh, name string into a part element. The subject heading is a little more involved. What we did here is we split the uh, subdivisions into two different parts, and we used encoding analog to provide their marked delimiters, which flag the uh, which flag the first part as a uh, subject and the second part as a genre term. And this third example of a name with a uh, title attached, um, we have a personal name element which is split into two parts, one for the name and one for the uh, title. And since the identifier, the source, and the rules only apply to Kermit the Frog and not the book before you leap, we've applied the identifier, source, and rules to the part that wraps, that wraps up uh, Kermit the Frog. And this is an example of some of the more intricate things that you can start doing with uh, headings in EAD3, thanks to the power of part and which provides a better compatibility with other descriptive standards. And now I'll pass it over to Regine. Uh, thank you, and we'll be taking questions at the end. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay. So my name is Regina Heberlein, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about EACCPF and a little bit about archive space. EACCPF, as uh, many of you know, is a specialized standard to encode corporate bodies, persons, and families. It's been an SAA standard since 2011. Um, it consists of an XML schema to encode descriptions of CPF entities and their relationships with one another, or with other entities, and that could, for example, be resources. It's an implementation of ISAR-CPF, the international standard 
archival authority record for corporate bodies, persons, and families. Boy, that is long. Um, which is now in its second edition, um, maintained by the International Council on Archives. Um, and ICRCPF has been an ICA standard since 1996. EACCPF version two was released in 2022 and is maintained by the Staatsbibliothek Berlin. So to create a valid EACCPF record, you really don't need a whole lot. You need a few things in the control section describing who is creating this record and under what conditions. And then a few things to describe the entity itself. So here we see a snippet of a control section. And what you need here is the maintenance status. You need the record ID. You need the maintenance agency. And in here, you need at least one of the agency code or the agency name. And then you need a maintenance history. And the maintenance history is again a wrapper and you need at least one maintenance event inside it. And in CPF description where you describe the entity itself, you need the identity element containing an entity type with an attribute value and one of person corporate body or family as data inside that attribute value and um, a name entry with at least one part. And so with just that handful of things, of pieces of information about your, um, your entity, you could walk away. But of course, the real power lies in describing how this entity relates to other entities. And that could include other CPF entities, but it could also include places, occupations, functions. It could include other resource entities. And here is a, an example of a relations element. Relations is a wrapper element around any number of relation elements. So each, so relation rather is repeatable and you can use it to describe how one entity relates to another. This one relates Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart to the Mozart family. And to do this, we have a target entity that is who has this relationship to the Mozart family. And then we have an optional relation type. What is the target entity's relationship to the Mozart family? So how does this relate to archive space? And just to back it up for half a second, um, I'm sure all of you know Archive Space is an open source community driven data management system for archival metadata. It's widely used in the US professional community, which is why we wanted to include it in this track of the webinar. It's also lovingly called A Space, so you'll hear and see me using that. Um, and its organizational home is Lyricis. That means Lyricis provides technical and back office support and hosting services, among other things. Archive Space 1.0 was released in 2013, but is now it's now on version 3.3. It's important to note that Archive Space is not an implementation of EAC CPF. Rather, it has its own data model and it supports EAC CPF as a serialization among others. This is a high level view of the major entities, of some of the major entities, I should say, that um, A Space defines. We have a resource record with multiple archival objects, those map to the EAD components which are in turn instantiated in containers and their subcontainers or in digital objects. 
And then many of those core entities may relate to agents, subjects, and events, three additional major entities in A-space. And uh, I should say that there are several others that I'm not even mentioning here, um, including accessions, container profiles, assessments, locations, and several others. Now, zooming in on the agent record in A-space, there are four major agent types. There's the usual suspects, person, corporate body, and family. And then there's also software. And um, you might use software, for example, to indicate, say, in a revision statement, when a scheduled routine has resulted in changes to the record. Just like EACCPF, the actual requirements for a valid A-space agent record are pretty minimal. You need a control section. In the control section, you need an ID and a source for the record. And then you need to say a few things about the maintenance of that record, including the status, the type, the date, who did it, and what their type is. And then for the actual entity, you need the name order and you need a part of a name. A space helpfully indicates the required fields with a red asterisk, as you can see here. And it will actually not save the record until those fields are populated. Here in the name form section is also where you can specify the source and the rules for your heading, even though you don't have to. Um, and then again, with those few things, you could save the record and be done. And again, that would be kind of pointless because then your agent record would simply exist in the database with no connection to anything else. So on this screen, the description information section of the record, um, you can flesh out the record a bit and relate it to um, dates, genders, places, occupations, functions, topics, languages, and you can see how these map very comfortably to EAC CPF. And then in the relation information section of the record, you, can, you have the opportunity to relate one agent to another. You don't have to. Um, and you can relate an agent to an external resource. That would be one that is not maintained within a space. To link an agent record to another A-space record, you actually go into that record and select agent links. And then you use the role property to link an agent as the creator, source, or subject. I'm providing here a CPF mapping to an agent record for your reference in case you want to come back to it. And then here, also for your reference, we have a mapping of a, an agent record to the two flavors of EAD, EAD 2002 and the um, updated version, EAD 3. Note the slight differences here in authority ID and relator, as well as name part. So now let's talk about subjects. Subjects are another module in archive space. And what you need to create an archive space subject record is even more minimal than an agent record. You basically just need the term itself. You need a source and you need a type. Again, the required fields are highlighted with the red asterisk. And the thing to note here is that the source vocabulary comes from a controlled value list that you can change depending on your needs. Whereas the type vocabulary comes from a controlled value list that is pre-populated by the archive space software and that maps to subject types like genre form, geographic, and so on. For each subdivision of a term, you can select the type separately as shown here.
And again, I'm providing here um, a reference table to show how subject maps to EAD. And what I want to point out here is that cultural context maps to geog name, style period maps to genre form, and uh, technique and temporal actually currently are not exported. So that's something to possibly watch out for. Um, I want to just highlight a few things about importing and exporting agents and subjects to and from archive space. Um, depending on what exactly you're do doing, several things can happen that you might not be prepared for. So the first thing to note is that archive space is pretty smart and it will create agent and subject records from an EAD import. Um, it will apply a nifty deduping algorithm that to the best of my understanding is based on a combination of auth file number and string and some other logic. But there are some caveats. Among them, agent records created from an EAD import will lack the control fields because the EAD doesn't have that information, which also means that they will be invalid against CPF incidentally. Um, subject headings will be unstructured. And that is because in EAD 2002, subject headings don't have parts as Alex showed. And in EAD 3, they have parts, but archive space currently doesn't yet support import from EAD3. ASpace 3.3 supports import and export of CPF version one only. So it is behind because CPF is now on version two. It does support import and export of EAD 2002. And it supports export only of EAD3. So here are some resources that you may find helpful, including the tag libraries to the standards that we talked about today, um, and also some helpful webinars and related projects. And before we let you go, we would like to ask you to fill out this one minute, possibly less than one minute survey that um, our colleague Kirsten Arnold, who is on TSEAS, um, compiled, and that will help us and help the community uh, in um, revising the standards as they currently exist. So this will inform future standard revisions. And with that, I'm going to drop the link to the survey in the chat and turn it back to Corey. Thank you. All right. Well, I would like to thank Alex and Regina for um, their presentations and for sharing this with us today. Um, let me go ahead and stop the recording right now, and then we'll move on to our Q&A session.